so that gives oh, yeah. you an idea of where to start. So I'm going to be looking at my phone. I'm not texting my wife about dinner. Uh, I have my notes here, so I, I don't get lost in my stories. Um, so do you guys, do you feel like they have a pretty good understanding of UX? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so that, I mean, again, it's good to know because I didn't know about it when I, it, it's a very kind of new thing. Um, there's been human factors and UX, but it's fairly new in the, in the scope of um, an industry. And so um, kind of the idea of UX, I think, is best described as um, a lot of times it comes out of web design, um, but it's, it's empathy-infused web design. And so um, there's studies out there that you can find. It's, it's part of my presentations all the time about um, you know, who you guys and your proficiency with technology um, and the, the way that you use it is, is vastly different probably than a lot of the users of your products in the future. And so um, when we have developers and designers creating these, project, these products, whether it's a software product or a website, um, the way that you understand um, that system and how it works is vastly different than the end user, right? So the, the idea of UX or human factors is how do we design with those people in mind? And that's kind of the core of what I do. And so another way to, so UX typically breaks down into design and research. There can also be strategy as part of it. Um, but designers typically work on the actual, you know, concepts, fleshing those out. And then research, we support designers. And so um, we're the ones that give them bad news or tell them that you're doing a good job with your designs. Uh, and the idea is to solve usability problems before a product is actually developed. So when I say a product, I mean software, um, typically. Um, we're not working with physical products. Um, another way to think about UX research, specifically, which I think has been helpful for me, is we're kind of the radiologists um, of the medical field. So a radiologist will do the x-rays. They'll have an understanding of how to read those x-rays. Um, they'll present. Um, kind of what they find with those x-rays of a patient to the doctor or a specialist, but then they leave it to the specialist to decide what they want to do with that information. And so a lot of times they're going to have bad, you know, bad news. And so we're not always the designer's friends, although we work closely with them. We're not always the product owner's friends, um, but that's kind of why we're here. We're here to say, to be honest about the product and how well or poorly it works. Um, so that's a very high level overview of what I do. Um, and please, uh, again, as I kind of go through this, if you guys have any questions, just stop me um, and let's talk about it. Um, so, my, so going through your list here, Oren, um, current job title is UX researcher. The picture is a little bit misleading. I have <laughs> since updated my LinkedIn profile to fit with my aesthetic, but um, it's okay. That's long in the past now. Um, so, how did I get this job? How do you get into UX? So. Um, this program is amazing because, again, there's not, you can't go to any university and just say, I want to study UX. Uh, usually it's integrated somehow or there's people that are talking about it. Um, my background, I graduated, I did my undergraduate here at UNT, and I did sociology and I did advertising. And that actually fits really well into what I do as a researcher. And so um, for you guys to have this exposure now is amazing. And that's why I'm glad to be here because I think, um, you know, if I had known some of this stuff before, uh, it would have it would have sped up my process to get to UX. I think um, once I finally found UX, I was like, this is it, it makes sense. Um, but out of college, I started in market research. Um, and so what that means is I worked for a company that helped facilitate uh, market research projects for larger clients. And so, um, so market research has traditionally been kind of, um, a long time ago it was like mall intercepts. So you would go to the mall, they would grab you, you'd have a clipboard, like, hey, can you take the survey? Like, and you would get paid five bucks and you'd be on your way. Um, market research moved into online when they realized everyone had a computer um, and they started sending surveys uh, just to people's um, computers so they could take those surveys. Uh, and when I got into market research, we, they were just starting to shift into mobile market research. And so what that means is um, in the past, you would have to send a survey and say, Think back two weeks ago to the last time you were at the grocery store. Tell us about your experience. Um, and when I came into market research as an industry, um, we 
had acquired an, an application that could actually geofence stores. So we could push a survey to your phone and say, hey, take this survey for this, many, for this incentive while you're in the store, take a picture of the shelf, look for this product, um, and so it completely revolutionized market research. And so that was kind of an exciting time to be there. And that was kind of my first exposure to research, but also to UX because I was working with the UX to develop that application, but from a, you know, a different side of it. I, just, I got to see the design and all the stuff that went into it. Um, you know, some crazy quick stories from that is I worked with, for clients like Procter & Gamble and General Mills, um, they were very excited about this uh, technology to be able to, you know, have a survey done on a mobile device. Um, Procter & Gamble has a lot of products. The product I worked on um, was a team from Charmin. So we did some market research around their Charmin product and they wanted to understand the flushability of the product. <laughs> so if you guys can imagine, um, they wanted to, that to be an interactive survey experience, so they actually had us have participants record them flushing the toilet to get insight on how flushable their product was. And so we got to see some interesting things in that space. Um, so, uh, but I'm glad those days are past. Uh, I actually didn't have to look at any of those videos, but we hired a, a vendor to come in and review all that. So, um, so that was interesting. Um, so that's kind of where I, I started and then um, through friends and through um, connections, I found an opportunity to step into kind of a new UX team. And so um, UX, like I said, is fairly new. Uh, and something that I, I kind of I think about a lot is the um, maturity of an organization as far as UX goes. So um, when I say the maturity, UX maturity of an organization, you know, most companies are not software companies. So when I started in UX, I started in an um, auto finance company, uh, Santander. And they had a very small UX team, they didn't have any researchers, and I joined the team to be their researcher and build that practice. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of growing pains with that, um, but as you can imagine, they have a need for UX because they, you know, their customers want to pay their bills online. So they have to kind of be, become a technology company because their business hasn't traditionally been that. It's been auto finance and working at dealerships um, and brick and mortar banks, but now, their clients want and customers want to pay their bills online. So how do we support that? They're not a, they're not a technology company, and they never will be. So that's kind of why the smaller team. Um, I've since in the past three months transitioned to Saber, and so um, Saber is a software company, um, and there is benefits, plus and minuses to both. Um, you're never um, whenever you make a transition like that, you're kind of trading one set of problems for another set of problems. Um, but Saber is, you know, um, it's a software company at its core. So they function at a, a different pace, at a different level than, you know, a non kind of technology company would. And so I joined a team of ten researchers. So my company has ten researchers. I think they have sixty or so designers uh, in the whole organization, global organization. Um, since I'm new, I don't know all the stats, um, but a multi-billion-dollar company they're in the travel industry, and so what that means is they kind of were born out of American Airlines. They were the ones that actually created Travelocity and then sold it. Um, so they're in kind of the booking um, hospitality space, and so there I'm working on their, um, their hospitality product for hotels, and so um, I'm not working on the airline side, but I'm working on kind of a newer product line um, where it's the software that you would use to actually check in guests, or um, you know, if you make a if you make a reservation online, it connects to the this specific hotel system, so they see your reservation when you make it. And so that's the software I'm working on right now. Um, so, so, and at my previous company, it was a team of four UX members total for the whole organization. And it was a multi-billion-dollar industry, um, big company too, but it was a much smaller team. Um, so I, I do have a UX manager um, at this company. We have a VP of design. And so um, that's another kind of uh, piece to the UX maturity is how far up the chain does UX and design go, right? So um, at a smaller, younger, uh, mature organization, you're not going to have buy-in from the top down, right? You're going to have to kind of be 
um, doing things to kind of show your value. Uh, but at a company like Sabre, it's something that they've been talking about and um, have been doing at some level for a while. Um, and so some of my teammates have been at Sabre for like 20 years. Um, and so they've, you know, it's, it's obviously evolved and changed over time, but there's kind of that, um, that maturity that's at an organization like that that's not there at other places. And, um, but, you know, there's still people there that have never heard of UX. There's still people there. I had a, um, a conversation with a, a senior level person uh, at the organization that had, you know, had been there 16 years and never done any kind of usability or anything. So it's still, you know, even in an organization like that where you think, oh, this is like part of their DNA, it's not. You know, there's still people that you, you encounter that's, um, that don't do that. Um, so a typical day for me, um, this is a good question. So at this company, um, you know, it's, it's kind of all new for me, so there's a lot for me to kind of learn. So I went from, from auto finance to the travel industry. So for me as an individual, there's a lot for me just to learn about the terminology, the, the way the business is run. There's, there's some, similar, some similarities, um, but there, there's a lot that's different. And so, um, you know, a lot of my time is spent just in meetings and talking to people to understand how does this work? What, what, what do I need to know? What's the terminology? Kind of just getting my mind wrapped around the product. Um, we do um, design studios, design strategy workshops. We, can, we lead and conduct these, these workshops to, um, if there's a problem that we're trying to solve, we'll get together and collaborate and, and work together to solve that problem. So we have a designer in the room, we have a researcher in the room, we have um, someone from business representing uh, that side to know kind of the direction and we even validate those concepts with users um, on a, a frequent basis. Um, I do a lot of on-site visits at hotels so since um, you know one of the big things that we do as a re in research is what I call evaluative research and so we um, there's a lot of products that exist already and we need to evaluate how well or how poorly they're, they're working right and so um, you know, I can talk to someone on the phone, but it doesn't replace me going. And they could tell me like, yeah, it works fine, this works or, or not. But I actually need to go and see it in its environment, in its natural habitat, see how well it's functioning. Um, and while I'm at a, at a hotel, I can, I can have more conversation with them. I can capture like how long does it take to check in a guest. And I can start to quantify how long is it taking them to use our product versus a competitor product. So uh, that's some things that I do in a day. Um, sometimes that means travel as well, just depending on what you're studying. Um, we do a lot of usability testing, um, and I know that this department does have a usability testing course. Um, a lab, no. They have a lab now. Okay, that's great. So um, if you guys do have an interest in UX, um, I would definitely recommend that. Um, that is, I would say, the bulk of what I do, and so um, we break it down into. Um, remote and in-person sessions and so you'll probably and you'll probably get a little bit of a taste for this in that course but um, in person would mean sitting down with um, a participant to walk through a task or a website to, sh to, to see how well or poorly it works um, today I actually just launched my first remote test so there's tools that you can um, that you can use to build out a test and um, send it out to a panel of participants and get feedback instantly on a prototype or a screen or a mock-up or um, a website, whatever it might be. Um, so those are some of the things that I do on a regular basis. Um, one, one thing that I think is relevant to you guys is the two things I hated most uh, in college when I was in college was writing and presenting. Um, and I think that that's the bulk of what I do now, which is funny because I really despise it for some specific reasons when I was in school, but now I actually really love it. And so, um, even if you're like terrified of public speaking and, and hate writing, um, you just have to be put in the right context, and I think you'll look at it completely different. So just keep that in mind as you're being asked to present and being asked to write things. Um, you know, writing is so critical to synthesizing thoughts, um, and so and that can be applied to any industry. Um, but especially what I do when I'm I'm trying to, um, you know, 
beyond writing and presenting findings, what I'm doing is observing someone or something and documenting what I'm finding. So if that's the bulk of what I do, writing and presenting is a synthesis of all that documenting and I'm doing about what's working or not working. Um, and so that's kind of a big part of my, just at a high level, my process day to day. Um, so that's something good to kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're, as you're having these, these classes that, that ask you to do that. Um, so, um, and I think just to kind of summarize here, I think what's your greatest current challenge? So I've kind of talked around this a little bit, but, um, and this is also relevant for you guys. Uh, for me now, it's a little bit different because I'm, I've only been in this company for a few months, so I'm still kind of understanding what those problems are. Um, I think one of the biggest things uh, that we have a challenge of, and I think you guys will probably encounter in the future is, at least for our team, I, I have a really strong team. I work uh, every single day with three designers and another researcher. Um, but the bulk of the development team, so design, development, separate, right? Um, and for our product, most of our developers that are actually coding and creating these products are in Bangalore, India. So if you can imagine, um, you know, I think fundamentally there's some challenges there because there's a language barrier, there's a time barrier. I think right now in Bangalore it's 3.30 a.m. So if you think about when do you have meetings with your developers? Well, we have it at 7 a.m. There was a meeting yesterday at 10 p.m. Um, because we have to talk to them. We can't just do everything over email. And so um, that's a huge challenge. And uh, globalization, it, there's a book called The World is Flat, which is probably very dated by now. But it's, um, you know, companies are going to be outsourcing a lot of their development work overseas. And so how do you... Um, how do you work effectively as a team? So not just a geographical challenge of these two teams, but we're designing it, researching it, they're developing it. The way that they think um, about their job and their role is fundamentally different than the way that we are, just because they're thinking about how feasible is this? How do I build this? Um, you know, how does, what's the, the backend infrastructure of this server in order to pull this data in to do this? And, the designers are thinking about the user, they're thinking about how this flow should work. And so very different ways of thinking about something, but we're working together to build the same product. Um, and so I think um, that's a huge challenge for us right now. And I think as you guys are working together in your teams, you guys have strengths and challenge and strengths and weaknesses as a team. Um, and that's always going to be, that's why it's, this is the format of the class. If you, if you continue in this degree program, there's a, there's a senior level elective that Dr. Lamb teaches. I don't remember the... Media something. Yeah, it's something. But there's, there's the opportunity of computer science um, students to come in and participate. And part of the whole idea is to get some experience in research design, coding, and you're actually building an, an application. Um, and so that's a, a great class to take. That's, that's the closest representation I've ever seen in a uh, call it collegiate environment of like real world scenario, right? So, you know, it's always like, how do you work together as a team? But that is one of our biggest challenges. We're a huge organization and we have lots of products. Um, but how do you work with someone that might not just have different beliefs, but is in a different geographical location, a different way of viewing the same product, how do you guys collaborate? Um, and the more you can kind of work on that, I think uh, you're better served. So I think that's your questions uh, that I wanted to make sure I get through. And then I know that I kind of rushed through that. So if you guys have any questions specifically, yeah. Sorry, I didn't keep that. No. But um, so you said while you were um, test or researching how the effects of your, your software, you would go and visit. Uh, hotels and you would travel and then I know on the flip side with like the airline um, uh, with like especially like flight services and yeah. the front desk and all that they had a three-day health check every four hours for three days last weekend and like how does that how do you, do you guys get that information do you guys share that um it, like do we see any of the airline stuff like whenever they were doing their health checks were they reporting back to your team specifically 
Uh, not to our team, no. And the way the way that we have it organized at, at Sabre, at least, is you usually are, are designated to a product. The researchers, since there's fewer of us, you know, we have to kind of do a little bit more cross products. But yeah, since I'm I'm able to focus just on the hotel side, which means I don't see a whole lot of the, the airline side. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of presentations, a lot of knowledge sharing, and so I see a lot of that in those types of presentations, but not like day to day. Okay, so um, there's other researchers, um, and then there's you, so like, yeah. is the work split up, like, or yeah. do you all work together? Uh, for the most part, we work independently, separately. I get the luxury of working directly with another researcher, and so, um, and that's just how they decided to bring me on the team. Um, and that has been really unique for me to, to, to do, because in my past, I was the only researcher, so I was doing everything. Um, and that's part of the reason for my shift is I wanted to, you know, I had I knew some of the basics, but I wanted to join a team to be sharpened by others. And so I get the luxury, at least right now, of being directly connected with another researcher, and we do everything together. Um, so I mean, we'll, we'll it'll be divide and conquer, or we'll work collaborative, uh, collaboratively on things, just depending on what it is. Um, you know, we have different strengths and weaknesses, and so. I, with my market research background, I help a lot with survey design and survey, um, and she uh, works on other stuff. So it kind of depends on, on that, but uh, I feel very blessed to be able to work directly. Um, that's the other thing is, you know, depending on the company, they're gonna, the culture is going to be more collaborative versus not. Um, this is the, the most collaborative environment that I've been in, um, which I think is good, but collaborative at least, I mean, in, in my context means more meetings. So uh, so what that means is, yes, you're getting to get to know people and work directly with them, but you don't have any time to sit at your own desk and think about things, and, and you really have to like prioritize and figure that out. So to everything, there's like good and bad. You know, like, so like, I was like, I want to work collaboratively. That sounds so cool. Um, and it is really cool. Um, and if it's the right team, it works really well. And even if we work collaboratively, you know, we still have this you know, developer side that's still a big issue and, and difficult to kind of figure out how this is going to work. Um, but yeah, that answers your question. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah do you need that? Uh, but they can finish the question. Or, or we can. Mine's going to be faster. Or we can do it after if you guys, whatever you want to do. Yeah, let's just do it after maybe. Yeah, um, yeah I'll, I'll be able to hang out. So you guys Great, have thank you, Brian. Yeah. I have shamelessly stolen your idea and written my. <laughs> hey, there's no shame. There's no shame. On my phone while you were speaking. Uh, so I'm Adam Fout. Um, it says on my thing that I'm a project manager and lead content writer. That is correct. Um, so I'll walk you through this real quick, and then we can do more questions. But before we start, how many of you are tech com majors? Like that is your thing. Most people. Is anyone not a tech com major? Are you guys STEM majors? Are you? Used to be. What's that? I used to. Used to be. be? Change your mind. I did the same thing with biology. What do I? I'm a creative writing major. Okay, you're the one I need to talk to. And then what's your? Sales engineering. Okay, so I was an English major before I switched to tech com. I switched to tech com because creative writing pays nothing. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, it no, it, it it does, but you have to be good at it. And I guess I'm not good at it. <laughs> so what I like about TechCom um, and the degree that I got is it gave me the ability to write and make decent wages um, regularly. So with creative writing, you know, a lot of people become freelancers. They end up, um, you know, money is sometimes they get a, a whole lot from a big project, sometimes not so much. I can tell you I do creative writing also and uh, short stories pay nothing. Poetry pays less than nothing. You actually go into debt writing poetry. So I can make a decent wage and do my creative stuff on the side. So for you, I thought there'd be more of you. Um, this is a good way to, to you know, fund your creative uh, addiction. So in terms of what I do, let's start with what my business is. So it says Blue Steel Solutions. What we do is branding primarily. And so what that means is we work with small businesses or startups startup or a small business comes to us and they say, we have no idea what our brand is, 
We started as one guy with a truck. Now we have three guys and three trucks. We need a brand. And we say, okay, we will help you build a brand. So what does that mean? We make logos. So we have a designer on our team. We will write their website. I do a lot of that. We have another writer. He also does a lot of that. And then we will build their website. And then any other uh, materials they might need. So that could be print materials. That could be... Um, you know, signs, billboards, it just depends on what they want and what their customers need. Um, if they want other digital marketing stuff, so if they want someone to run their ads, we'll create the images for them, we'll create the writing for them, we'll write the ads, but someone else has to manage that. Um, you know, if they want to do something like, you know, the, there's a lot of different um, advertising platforms within like Yelp and stuff like that, we, uh, we send them somewhere else. If they want to do SEO, has anyone heard that term before? Search engine optimization, it's a, it's a scam. Um, don't, don't ever go into it, you'll be sad. So search engine optimization, we say go to someone else because that's like a black box. Um, so that's kind of what we do. So mostly, you know, everything that he does is at a much higher level, billions of dollars. We're lucky if we get into the millions of dollars. We have a very small team, so it's me, the other writer, um, the designer who's about to go away, and then our boss. And we we used to have a larger team, and we're cutting that down and just working with freelancers because it's cheaper and um, it's mostly it's cheaper, and that's why we're doing it. So what do I do? I says I'm a project manager. So when we have one of those clients come to us, my main job is to say what are all the things you need, and then who's going to produce that, and then make sure they're being produced in a timely fashion, and that's really it. Um, the reason I can do that is because. Up until that point, I did all the writing. I would help with the websites. I would do a little bit of design work, um, which I could only do because of the stuff I learned in this program, the design stuff. And um, you know, so I'm able to understand what needs to be done. And then I have to do a lot of what I do is editorial. So I look at what everyone has written, and I say, you know, you need to write this section, or you know, this image is wrong, or this logo has this error. Let's fix it. Um, so that's kind of, that's my day to day, but we're a remote team. So we used to have an office, there was four of us in a space about that size, and it was horrible. Um, and eventually we said, why are we paying $800 a month when we all have homes? And so we went back to our homes and that's where we work from. So my typical day, that's on there, right? A typical day at work is I wake up at 8.59 <laughs> and I turn on my computer and then I see if there's any messages, and then if there's not, I go into breakfast. So um, one thing that I do want to talk to you guys about is um, you know, quality of life stuff. Uh, going into marketing, there are a lot of teams that are remote in the marketing space now, what, you know, not doing the stuff that we do necessarily. There are branding teams, I'm sure. But there are a lot of marketing teams that are remote. Some of them are very large and are doing billions of dollars of work. They're building these you know, crazy websites for millions of dollars. So, Remote work is awesome. Um, I can't recommend it enough. My happiness level has skyrocketed since I stopped having to go to an office. So, you know, I talk about that because there are not a lot of different um, jobs where you can do that. Some places you really do have to be on site. Some jobs it's just not possible to do otherwise. Um, so that's something to think about too when you're going, you know, forward with what you want to do after you get out of here is what kind of quality of life do I want? Some people have kids already, they want to have kids. If I had kids, it would be make my life a lot easier dealing with them. Most of my boss has kids, and that's one of the main reasons that she wanted to go remote, is that it allows her to, she can leave at three o'clock from her computer. If there's a problem, you know, she can call me. Um, everything's digital, most of this, very, very rarely do we have uh, timelines that are bad, so it gives her a lot of flexibility. She spends a lot more time with her children. Not having to commute in DFW, does anyone commute here? Right, so you understand how much that sucks. So not having to deal with DFW traffic is huge. Um, so, and that's very possible within the marketing space. Now if you have any skill in writing, um, the main skill that I think you need to do, specifically what I started as, which is a content writer, is you have to be good at grammar. And I don't mean that you can write something and it looks good, I mean you have to be able to explain that. You have to understand what the parts of speech are, you have to be able to break it down, because you will have, and I've had this happen over and over, some client who uh, believes that because they run a business that they know everything needs you to explain specifically why the horrible sentence they've written is horrible. 
And so you have to be able to break that down and say, you know, this is why I rewrote it this way. It's not personal, buddy, but this is better this way. You'll get more money. So please trust me. Um, a lot of what I do, has anyone taken a rhetoric class in here? They used to have rhetoric in 1320, right? In English, the required one? Nobody? All right, then. Well, if you're going to do content writing, rhetoric is probably after grammar the thing that I use the most. Because what I'm doing when I'm writing an ad, when I'm writing a website, is I'm trying to convince people to take action. I'm arguing with them about why they want to buy this product, why they want to click this button. So, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty, my boss's title is, um, boss, <laughs> I guess. Um, I change her title every now and then. She doesn't care. The CEO, president, man, owner. Uh, what business unit do we work in? There's none. Um, what's your greatest challenge? I mean, honest to God, it's just waking up on time. <laughs> the, you know, that, and that is, if you do, if you are a person, I'm going to say this being real with you guys, if you're lazy, remote work might not be for you. Um, it is hard to get up on time when nobody is watching, when nobody cares when you're available, when all they care about is that you've answered the message and that stuff is done. For me, that's great. I love that because it means effectively I work fewer hours and still get paid the same amount because I can com you know, compact the work. I don't have to waste hours and pretend that I'm working at a desk. If I'm done at 2 p.m., I'm done. And my boss doesn't care if I'm done at 2 p.m. If I'm done at 11 a.m. and I need want to take a four-hour break to go disc golf, I can go do that and then come back and work in the evening. If I want to just take the day off or the week off, my boss is very flexible on that. And so working in a small business gives me a great deal of flexibility, and, I, and it pays well, too because my boss doesn't, is not paying for really much of anything, a few pieces of software and then us. So most of her dispensable cash is going towards employees. So she's able to give me a very decent wage um, and is able to give me raises that are nice. And so I want to stress that too, is that when you're working in these large corporations, I mean, no offense, <laughs> but they got benefits and I don't have those. Um, marry someone who gets benefits. That's what I do. But other than the benefits, right, it's true. Other than the benefits, um, you know, they got the wages are structured. You know when you're going to get it. It's often not the biggest raise in the world. Sometimes you can get bonuses, sometimes not. With me, I walk in and I say, I would like to buy this thing next year, so give me like $6 more an hour. And my boss will be like, cool. So not $6 an hour. But, um, so that's pretty much it, and we still have time. Um, so. Does anyone have questions? Yes. Okay, um, so you said about grammar. Do you ever have like any issues where like a client will like absolutely like oh, yeah. argue their point? Yeah, absolutely. And so I just give up. That's it. Yeah, I just give up. So I will tell them why they're wrong and in a very nice way. And then when they argue with me, I will say, okay, because it's theirs. You know, if, what, at the end of the day, they're paying me money to give them a thing. Okay, so you're not. No, no. I used to be, but I don't care. I mean, if they want to write something stupid on their website that they paid for, and I have ver made it very clear that they're wrong, and they're going to insist on it, okay. That's not my fault. You know, that's not my problem anymore. But good question. Some people get broken up. With that. Yeah. What's the primary way that your clients discover your company? Like, how would they know, I need branding, let me go to Blue Steel Solutions? Right. So, um, a lot of our business is referral based. My boss mostly does sales at this point. Um, so, other clients that we work for, she started as a freelancer. And she was in this program too, um, you know, seven or eight years ago. And she, before the full TechCom program existed. And, um, you know, she started as a freelancer. She just made websites for people basically. Sometimes she would write the content for those websites. Um, and she was just living project to project essentially, and she kept getting bigger projects until she couldn't write anymore, create enough websites in uh, that amount of time required. So she started hiring people. And so a lot of it is referrals from previous clients. A lot of it is content marketing. Is that a term anyone has heard before? Mm -hmm. But surely we've all read blog posts before as content marketing. So that's how a lot of what we do is um, we write blog posts, people come to the website, they see that I guess we're not idiots and they decide they want to hire us. Um, you know, but it's, that's, a lot of that is, uh, we don't do ads. I mean, we did for a while, but we don't really waste money on ads anymore. Um, it's primarily just reputation based and um, we do some cold calling actually, but um, 
you know, it's on. It's a really specific uh, industry that we're calling because we know how to do this really specific thing for um, a very specific product. So, yes. In our uh, in our reading this week, we learned about like accessibility. Mm -hmm. How does how does your company or, or you specifically handle accessibility? Oh, we ignore it completely. <laughs> so the UX stuff I was listening to, I was like, man, it sounds great. We would never do that. Because we don't um, have the money or the resources or any of that stuff. So most of what we're doing, like if a company that we work with grows big enough to where they have to actually think about that kind of stuff, they're going to go hire someone bigger who, can, who has a team who can implement stuff like that. I mean, we any, basically, if it's in uh, WordPress, we build all our websites in WordPress, if there's an accessibility feature built into WordPress, then it's there, but we don't do anything extra. I mean, I, we write all text sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's, but sometimes. Now, it's, it really <laughs> depends on, honestly, like my mood. Do I want to write this all tag or not for these people? Because nobody wants to pay for that. When you go to a small business, it's not that they don't want to, they just can't. Their money has to be very specifically targeted. So when we go to a small business, even if they've got you know revenue in the 10 to $50 million range, like they're, they're, they have a very specific budget for this website, and when you tell them, and I mean some of these guys, you know, they're like, they've been working with machines for like a hundred years, their arms are gigantic, right? They know nothing about this stuff. And we say, well, we should put these alt tags in here so that people who are blind could read these images. They'll be like, eh, I don't want to pay for that. And that's it, that's the end of the conversation. So it's unfortunate, but that's, that's the way it goes with our customers. That's a good question. Okay, so you work from home, so does that mean that, like, do y'all ever, like, have a group meeting mm -hmm. or anything like that? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so we use um, video software all the time to, um, you know, to, we have meetings every week where on Zoom, do you guys know what Zoom is? It's, so we use Zoom, uh, we used to use Skype, um, but yeah, we'll have weekly meetings and then with team members, most of the time it's easier to just get online and talk about um, whatever's wrong with the document or the uh, design rather than me trying to type it all up in an email. So yeah, we do that regularly and because we're all, we're all in the DFW area, so we do meet um, from time to time and I mean we'll meet with clients in person and stuff. but. I mean, two weeks ago, um, I went to Wyoming and I just worked remotely the whole time there. And we met with clients through, you know, I was on a phone call or we would do Zoom. So I think, you know, for most of those small businesses, they're totally fine with, you know, having a, a meeting not in person. There are some old school guys who really want to see me in person, but not, not very often. That's a good question. Any other questions? That's it. Thanks, Thank you. Guys.